tonight from the Seacoast Weather Deck desk. <laughs> we can expect a few clouds with a low of 35. Tomorrow during the day, it should be uh, sunny and about 49. Sunday night, partly cloudy skies with a low of 25. Monday, partly cloudy with a high of 37. Tuesday, we're going to have a little sunshine, a high of 38. Wednesday, we can expect some rain or some snow showers with a high of 40. Thursday, we're looking at a 60% chance of rain showers, a high of 46. And on Friday, partly cloudy with a high of 38. And that's your seacoast weather. note that the views expressed on this program are those of the individuals who speak them, and not necessarily those of Portsmouth Community Radio, its Board of Trustees, members, volunteers, or underwriters. Good evening and welcome to Spirit Radio. I am your host, Willie Hassel. Along with my co-host, Lynn Nickerson, we will take you on a journey, a journey into the unknown, where the paranormal becomes the normal, a journey to a world cloaked in darkness, where reality becomes a thin veil. So sit back, relax, and join us as we venture into the shadows, the darkness, the unknown, and back. Hello, good evening, and welcome once again to Spirit Radio, the Paranormal Experience. I am your host, Willie Hassel, your gatekeeper to the dark side, your guide to the realm of the unknown, the unseen, the unthinkable. And she is, of course, the always lovely. She is the mystical. She is the mysterious. Lynn Nickerson, good evening, Lynn. Good evening, Willie. I'm so happy to be here. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm, I'm, doing uh, I'm doing okay, actually. Well, uh, if we if we're connected, I should think you'd be ecstatic. <laughs> well, we'll find out. In, <laughs> we'll find out in a minute. Uh, it's been so long since I actually did this. Now I forgot where all the uh, plugs and cables go. But yeah, we're in the process gonna, of skyping our friend over in the UK. Gonna, so, so we're, we're hoping all keep the our connections fingers are crossed good. for just a minute. And hopefully, this week on Spirit Radio, the Paranormal Experience, uh, once again. We welcome to the broadcast our good friend Steve Parsons, known by his peers and leading academic parapsychologists as one of the best paranormal investigators in the UK. Steve has been a full-time investigator for over 20 years. He is co-founder of Parascience and a member of the Spontaneous Case Committee of the Society for Psychical Research. That's easy for some people to say. <laughs> Uh, Steve has contributed to and participated in numerous documentaries for broadcasters worldwide, including productions for the Discovery Channel, National Geographic Channel, Japanese TV, and for both BBC and other UK broadcasters. And Steve is also the author of Paracoustics, Sound and the Paranormal, and his latest release, uh, Ghostology, The Art of the Ghost Hunter. So I'm going to keep my fingers crossed right now, and hopefully, welcome to the show, Steve. 
sorry, Willie. We're just playing with oh, you. Oh, you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we both had little mini heart attacks. Uh, Willie. <laughs> Good morning. How are you doing, Steve? <laughs> you know me. Never, no point in complaining. Nobody listens. Well, you have a, we have a very good connection. You sound wonderful. Yes, you do. You sound like you're in the next room. And, and you don't even you sound know. like... You don't, don't even look behind you. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> You don't even sound like you're half asleep over there at, uh, hey, what is it, you know, almost 10 night. past 2 in the morning for you? Uh, 8 past what? 2, yeah, but we work nights, two? we're used to it. Yeah, I know. Well, we appreciate When the it. dead come out to play, we have to go chase them. Oh my goodness, <laughs> you are so clear, right. I, and there's no a, delay either. Yeah. I'm impressed. Oh, I don't <laughs> no, you're five hours behind me. <laughs> Welcome five to hours the... for the signal to reach North America. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad to have you back, Steve. Good to be back. So, how's um, how's life up at Hampton Beach then? Oh, oh it's, quiet and yeah, uh, you quiet may, reached thing, sixty yeah. today. Oh, hey, yeah. we're in uh, yeah, we're in the high sixties, uh, but we're in the middle of a eighty mile an hour windstorm again. Oh, really? Yeah, it seems like, seems every like, time you you keep sending us these low pressures. I know. The last time we talked to you, we were having 80 mile an hour winds for about yeah. a yeah, was Yeah, it was, yeah, it was yeah. Uh, Steve and Cal both, and it was horrendous weather. For the last um, three months, since the beginning of December, uh, I think we've had about 75 days where winds have been 50 mile an hour plus. Wow. Oh, my gosh. And over in Fuji, they've got 224 mile an hour winds with that cyclone they've got. Oh. Today, did you hear about that? Uh, no, but we've been uh, up. Uh, we've been out most of the day. We took the, uh, the the small the small ghost hunters up to Cardiff, which is <laughs> the, cap- the, ca- the capital city of Wales. Oh, yeah. uh, are, are you talking about, about your mini little ghost hunters? Min- mini me, yeah. <laughs> your mini me's. <laughs> well, two of the mini me's. There were three mini me's, but two of the mini me's. So you um, went to Cardiff. We went to Cardiff, which is it's about the size of Boston. Mm-hmm. I, it's the I've, capital uh, of Wales. I've been there. I've um, we been went there, specifically actually. because uh, one of the mini me's wanted uh, to visit the Lego store. Oh, of course. Um, <laughs> and get some new Lego toys, and he was he, he was actually quite disappointed because high on his list or top of his list was the Lego Ecto One Ghostbuster vehicle. Uh, um, because right. Daddy recently bought what's now in in the house called Daddy's Doll's House, which is the uh, ghost the Lego fire station. Oh no, kidding! Uh, well, did was, he get it or not? N- unfortunately, he had to settle uh, for Nexo Knights. Uh, um, dang! But, but he keeps looking. At, everybody calls this fire station Daddy's Doll's House because you know we're in the. So yeah, I mean it's. Yeah. Um, He's not going to let you forget it, you know. No. No. Um, You'll hear about it. <laughs> well, he's hoping one day to inherit it. <laughs> I think he's going into the real estate business after Daddy's uh, fire station. Um, but, yeah, yeah he's, he's, it's kind of right, the joke, because like, like so many things that I do... Um, and I'm always trying to, you know, warn people, don't get me involved in stuff, because I, I, I like to, you know... I tend to get a bit obsessed with things, and um, no, the fire station has become <laughs> super detailed. Should we just leave it like that? Mm. Okay. And, and as the year progresses, there are we we have Thanksgiving and Halloween and Christmas costumes. <laughs> you don't want to know, honestly. <laughs> I'm going to take a wild stab here, but are you a Virgo? Uh, no. What are you? I'm a Capricorn. Well, something's wrong. You must have Virgo rising. You are so technical. Mm. Um, and they, they're very precise. The, very precise people. I thought that was also about Capricorns. As well, well, that that could be. That could be. <laughs> it, it might be a secondary trait for Capricorns, but you know, you're an exception to every rule. Mm, yeah, I guess. <laughs> and that's a compliment. <laughs> I'll go with that one. <laughs> that's that's a good thing. Well, um, since Steve has p- participated in so many documentaries and international broadcasts, I, it's kind of mind blowing. But he's garnered all of this experience. In ghost hunting, and what I wanted to do to start this off was to kind of give a, a little review of the book so that our audience has a context for tonight's show. So I'm going to do a, just a little review here, Steve, so that they know what we're talking about. Cool. So, Ghostology, the Art of the Ghost Hunter, is a perfect primer for the ghost hunter, be they a beginner, an amateur, or seasoned. So in it, Steve covers the suggested protocol in various stages of the ghost hunting process, as well as review the many 
uh, devices, the use of the many devices, and you also present additional facts to consider. Now, your advice is given sparingly because you leave most of it up to the investigator, which I think is really good, but you do suggest which devices and which approach might get the best results or the most reliable results if someone is looking for repeatable, measurable, measurable evidence. So as you explain in your book, and I'm going to paraphrase this for brevity, ghostology takes into account both spiritism and psychology, but also draws on the sciences, engineering, and humanitarian disciplines. Ghost investigators take upon themselves the pursuit of tracking and understanding ghosts under the most unscientific conditions, working through chaos at times or under other variables like atmospheric conditions or temperature changes or electric, excuse me, just a minute here, electric or magnetic fluctuations. So these situations are also compounded by the caprice of human nature because sometimes we humans do make mistakes. So for a ghost hunter, it's difficult to weed out the chaff and get to the heart of the paranormal matter. Ghostology prepares the would-be ghost investigator to be as prepared and aware as possible in order to establish some kind of controlled situation that is measurable from which conclusions can be drawn. But let me just uh, add this as, as a personal note. Let's not forget that there there's always a measure of unpredictability when dealing with the human spirit, and there are those elements sensed by some and not by others where measurement or explanation remains elusive. So my my feeling is this is a great little primer, and if anybody's really interested in the ins and out of ghost hunting, this is an excellent book. So, Steve, my first question to you is, I'd like to know, first off, when the scientist in you was born? Oh, yeah. First of all, the first thing I'm going to say is before you do anything else, put that review on Amazon. Um, <laughs> no, 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 I'm not going to put it on Amazon. Oh, please. Uh, when was the scientist... I think you're upset. I think the the answer to that question is um, is in the is in is actually in the question itself. Uh, I I I think you are born uh, to have a particular bias in your life, or I think there's a measure of upbringing in that. My, my dad oh, was an engineer. When did you recognise it in yourself? Then I, I don't actually. <sighs> I mean, were you, as a kid, did you, were you interested in ghosts? Did you did you take your um, little torch with you I, and go into old yeah, barns and whatnot? Yeah, I, I was dealing with the question of being, you know, from a scientific perspective. Uh, in, when did I recognise that in me? I mean, mm -hmm. the the interesting ghost. Yes, it's. I thought it started much later than it did. You know, it's very fashionable to, uh, for people involved in the paranormal, be they medium or, or ghost investigator, to create a backstory, to create a a history. Um, you know, they had their first experience as they popped out of the womb, um, <laughs> uh, the blah, blah, blah. Uh, I see, I, I can uh, realistically remember my first experiences as a teenager, um, a, a growing interest in the paranormal, reading books um, and wanting to know more. However, um, my parents are getting on a little bit now, and they get they reach that embarrassing age when they start to tell you st tell everybody <laughs> stories about when you were a child. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and over the the last couple of years, I've discovered, um, and I have no recollection of uh, that. I used to, at age five uh, and younger, uh, well, very early days, I had an imaginary friend, which oh really. Um, which was a discovery to me. But from about age five onwards, whenever we went uh, family days out or holidays, I would always get quite vocal, um, even to tears sometimes, and demand to be taken to look for ghosts. Really? Um, and at age eight, um, my mum was disturbed uh, to discover me in the garage uh, having made a Ouija board and conducting a <laughs> seance with a group of friends. Now... All of that is a complete mystery to me. I have no recollection of really? any of that whatsoever. That is truly um, unique. So, um, as I, I got interested, did, I can let me ask you, Steve, twelve, did, thirteen. Did they send you to a child psychologist? No, no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, they, I, I, I you know, certainly on holiday, and we, you know, when we went on days out, they would, I, I guess, indulge me. Um, I don't think certainly my father wasn't that disturbed by what what uh, you know my interest in the paranormal as it transpired. And again, something I only learned in the last ten years. 
um, talking to my dad, mm -hmm. um, that my grandmother, his mother, um, and many of, his, of her generation of the family were heavily involved in the spiritualist church um, oh, yeah. and were themselves mediums they and it was something i was able to go back and check i went through my library you know the the who's who of spiritualism back in the 1920s and 1930s and dug out you know who was involved in which particular spiritualist church and lo and behold there was half my great you know sort of grandparents generation really so uh yeah and some that of was, your relatives Sorry, Some yeah, these are like my grand, my grandmother, um, her brother, sister, oh, um, their parents were all involved in the spiritualist movement. And again, this was something that was a complete mystery to me. I, I knew nothing about it because it wasn't something that we, mm. I, I think, we, you know, just accepted it. Even my, I mean, my dad has told me tales of he, he himself had, you know, experiences where he could. Uh, we would call them psychic experiences and you know that would you know, get him a, cl a clip around the ear um so you were truly born into it weren't you i i i i guess i must have been but there is no memory of it my first memory happens as a teenager when we're given a religious project to do at school at high school uh, and I chose to do spiritualism because it was kind of off the wall and I thought it would annoy the teacher. <laughs> um, That's and, a good reason. You know, it sort of suited the rebel in me to do something that nobody else was trying to do. Um, plus, of course, by that stage, I was already interested in ghosts. So yeah. it, kind of, it kind of suited me as well. Okay, so did you? I think ever... it was the anarchist in me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's always that element. Um, oh, there is. <laughs> did you ever consider yourself psychic? No, no, um, and I don't recall ever having any psychic experiences. Um, really? I mean, inevitably, you, you, I think everybody involved in this field um, has been at the point where a psychic has come up to you and said, "You know, you're a, a psychic, or you should open up more and recognize your own abilities." But no, I don't. I can't recall ever having a psychic moment. Um, you know that. You I mean, I've had paranormal experiences, but not you know mm. not where I've had a psychic experience. It seems to me well, you're very grounded, so maybe you should become more flighty. <laughs> uh, no, I'm quite happy as I am. <laughs> it, it, it sounds like he's just about as psychic as I am. Yeah, but that's yeah. really but, odd. But that's okay. Go ahead, Steve. What were you saying? No, I. I I, I'm quite happy where I am. Um, but it, what's interesting is that this, that sort of block from uh, whenever it began, you know, with the imaginary friend, uh, apparently we lived in a house that, that had a reputation for being haunted for yeah. the first four years of my life. And I was, you know, I, I would talk to a person who wasn't there and, uh, you know, but none of that I remember. You know, none of that stuck. Yeah. Uh, obviously it did stick, but, you know, I can't go back and go, well, you know, I remember my first experience as I rolled across the floor in diapers and <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing, nothing, zero zip zilch, all erased. Maybe one of these days you'll, you'll uh, get regressed, get that yeah, checked out. That yeah. would be, might be, it might be, might be a telling. really traumatic experience. <laughs> <laughs> might be best therapist. Alone, huh? Well, I'd like to get into uh, a couple of the pieces of equipment you use, but I wanted to ask you before we get into that, do you heavily rely on other psychics and mediums when you go on an investigation? Or is uh, it just purely scientific for you? Oh, gosh, no. Um, we rely on all sources of information because when you're dealing with um, any investigation, the first piece of information that you that you have is somebody had an experience. You know, they come to you or you yeah. read about or learn about somebody had some sort of unusual experience that they believe to be paranormal or, or in some cases they were told was paranormal. Um, and they're seeking in more information, they're seeking guidance, they're seeking assistance in some rare cases. Uh, but you only have, it's a bit like a crime scene investigator, all you mm -hmm. have first of all is the witness's account of what happened to them. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you dismiss that or you take any right. sort of 
biased view of it by saying, well, you know, well, it sounds like a load of rubbish, therefore it is. You, you've already yeah. ruined any chances you've got of conducting a fair and unbiased investigation. Uh, so you start off on that basis and you use every everything that you can do. I mean, it's complete folly to to turn up with all of the flight cases and the black van with the logo down the side and all of the other nonsense that you see on the television because what you're what you really need to do um, is to uh, you know obviously meet the people once you've gone through all of those stages and you decide to arrive at the property um, it's simply to be there you know mm -hmm. our team when we conduct an investigation um, the, you know we frisk we frisk them and we remove all their equipment um, because well we don't literally but you know we've trained them not to use it now uh, because it's primarily about being in the same place hopefully at the same time and hopefully trying to have a similar experience to the original experience and try to understand it and formulate questions you know why did they have that experience what what could have created the experience can we test anything about the experience if they said that the temperature dropped well we could measure the temperature. If they said that they heard a sound, well, we can record the sound. If they saw, said that they saw something, well, hopefully we can take a camera or a video re uh, camera and hopefully we can, you know, try to capture the same thing and have that extra information to work with. That also includes the use of psychics and mediums because they have... Uh, what they believe to be a special ability, a, an ability that I lack, that other people, you know, lack mm -hmm. as well. Um, where I always exercise caution and where I would always, and within ghostology, uh, urge people to exercise caution is not to give uh, the medium excessive credibility. That's not to dismiss what they're doing, but you have, for example, you may have 12 people in the building as part of your team. Uh, you know, I picked a, a number at random. Teams are bigger or smaller. Um, some of them may have told you that they're psychic or sensitive. But then, then there is a tendency within a lot of investigators to give additional credibility to that person's testimony, to what they experience whilst they're there, to what they uh, feel and sense in reality what you should be doing is giving equal weight and balance to everybody's experience mm -hmm. whether they believe that they're psychic or uh, or, or not uh, certainly you know we we would when we do work with psychics and mediums and we're very interested in their experience we're very interested in any sensations, anything that they, t anything at all that they can tell us, but we're equally interested uh, and no less interested in any of the reports from any member of our, you know, any other person that was there. I think that's uh, wise. Because at the end of the day, the psychic, you own, you realistically only have that person's word that they are psychic or sensitive because mm -hmm. we can't realistically test them. That's right. So you, so. You know, should we be giving them additional credibility simply on their say so? I mean, y you talked about my intro at the start of the show, and and it was a fantastic introduction. Um, but does that really make me any better a ghost hunter than anybody else listening to the show? I think you're more thorough. I I think everybody has the potential to. Uh, some some months ago, um, I. They, you're, you're aware I co-host with Ron on Ron Kolek on Ghost Chronicles International, right. and he he has that habit of introducing me using a title the Wall Street Journal gave me a few years ago <laughs> as the gold standard in ghost hunting. And I remember saying to him um, because we were filming a documentary whilst we were on air one night, um, and he called me you know the gold standard in ghost hunting which is what the wall street journal called me and i said back it's actually a sad indictment on ghost investigation because if you can become the gold standard just by practicing common sense and using what are very basic skills then what does that say 
you know, what's the implication for the rest of ghost hunting? Because I'm not doing anything particularly clever. Um, you know, the science isn't rocket science. It's very, very basic high school science. Uh, the stuff that we learned at high school, uh, how to set out a science experiment mm -hmm. and how to conduct a science experiment. Well, yeah, I think you, you that shouldn't point, make me the go, the gold standard, really. Well, you you point things out, uh, you know, beforehand that people probably don't always think of. I mean, you are very thorough. There are just things that until they they go through the experience of different locations and situations, then they garner the experience. But you've got it, and you've introduced it in your book, and you give a a broad spectrum of things to look at and consider before going out. So that's why you're the gold standard. You're very thorough. Ah, okay. Well, that's that's reassuring to know. But and, I, and I still, and besides, I, I, the Wall Street would, Journal said so. They know what they're talking about. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I guess they do. Um, but it, it it's you know as I've said and as I've presented talks and as I hope I get across in ghostology, um, it's not rocket science. But there is there is a tendency with a a lot of people um, to rush headlong at it and think that by buying the latest piece of technology and by listening to crackly voices on broken radios and digital recorders, <laughs> that that is proof. They never seem to ask the question, uh, or the obvious questions, how are the sounds getting on? Where are they coming from? Are they really dead people or is it perhaps a 911 number or a Mm -hmm. aircraft flying over which are probably much more likely scenarios but ones that they'd like to consider because that would de dismiss Discredit what they're really them. there for yeah. yeah you know it used to be many many years ago ghost hunting was terribly unfashionable but terribly popular within the media people have been writing books about ghosts and haunts things and they've always been bestsellers right the way back to the uh, 18th century and beyond yeah it's very uh, popular ghost hunting has always been a very popular genre yeah but not very many people uh, did it and certainly not many people would ever admit to doing it until <laughs> until lately yeah until, it's more accepted until the, the, the last 20 years yeah it's become uh, Steve, we are, sorry to interrupt you, we are at the bottom of the hour, so we're going to have to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're talking with Steve Parsons, who is the author of Ghostology, The Art of the Ghost Hunter, and when we come back, we will talk about the EMF meters, K2 meters, and ghost boxes and whatnot, so don't go away. Programming on WSCA receives support from 3S Artspace, a new nonprofit alternative arts organization that combines a mid sized performance space, a non commercial art gallery, and a locally sourced restaurant. Find a full calendar online at 3SArts.org. Supernatural Magazine, the UK's newest paranormal magazine, provides support to Spirit Radio, the paranormal experience. It is the magazine's goal to bring every aspect of supernatural news and research from around the world under one roof to create a universal platform for all those interested in the supernatural. More information is available at supernaturalmagazine.com. You are listening to Spirit Radio, the Paranormal Experience on WSCA 106.1 FM, and we'll be right back after this short break. Listening to Spirit Radio, the Paranormal Experience on WSCA 106.1 FM in Portsmouth West End and from the community calendar, Soundstage 909, 
presents Paranormal Evidence Review with Spirit Chasers Paranormal. The team from Spirit Chasers Paranormal, along with special guest Val Lofaso of Seacoast Paranormal Research Group, will be holding an evening of paranormal fun and education on Friday, March 11th from 6 to 8 p.m. on the new Soundstage 909 right here at the WSCA Studios. Located at 909 Islington Street, Suite 3 in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And 100% of the donations from this event will go to help support WSCA, Portsmouth Community Radio. More information is available online at spiritchasersparanormal.com. And Lynn, you have some upcoming guests? Yes, our upcoming guest list starts with the 27th of February next week. Um, our friend Richard Hall, author of Haunted Route 66, was booked for this date, but he had to reschedule, unfortunately. So what we might do with this is have a discussion between Willie and myself and uh, have open lines and leave it open for the audience to call and participate. On March 5th, we have Preston Dennett. He's been on Spirit Radio several times now. He's an investigator with MUFON, and he's joining us to preview his latest release titled Not From Here. Uh, March 12th, it was Sam Queen and Jamie Davis who co-wrote Haunted Asylums, Prisons, and Sanatoriums. Jamie can't make this interview, unfortunately. She should be with us sometime in the future. But Sam is returning to wrap up the remaining stories of some of these insanely haunted locations. On March 19th, our good friend Tom Spitaleri, director of Essex County Ghost Project, is returning to our studio to talk about his latest investigations, as well as surprise us of his lineup of speakers for the Paranormal uh, Festival coming up uh, in April. March 26th, uh, we also had Jeremy Dontremont scheduled, and he, he has to reschedule, so we will probably have another uh, discussion. April 2nd, Michelle Matusas. She's a psychic medium empath who is also an historic reenactor and a member of the Spirit Light Network. And she's releasing her own deck of tarot cards, all of which display her own artwork. So she'll be talking to us about this unusual enterprise. And April 9th, Dean Merchant, who's a local UFO enthusiast, he's one of the original organizers of Exeter's um, annual UFO festival. He's currently working on his first book, which is the history of UFOs in the Exeter area, as well as in other parts of New England. And his research goes all the way back to the 17th century here in New England. So there are records of uh, UFO incidences back in the 1600s. So that completes our guest list. All right. So why don't we, with that, why don't we go back to tonight's guest? Uh, I'm sure he's still there because I, th- mm. I, I think I can hear him breathing on the phone line. <laughs> uh, but he is on Skype, so that means the phone is open tonight if uh, anybody wants to call. Uh, 603-430-9722. Steve, welcome back. Welcome back, Steve. <laughs> oh, no, it didn't happen before. How does he make that noise? You can't fool us twice. We're too smart for that. (laughs) Um, EMF meters, I wanted to talk to you about that. Um, The investigator can be duped by using it because there's electrical currents of all kinds in the atmosphere. There's the Earth's magnetic um, currents. So at what point, Steve, do you feel you can rely on the information coming from an EF meter and perhaps you might like to explain exactly what it is some people may not know right well we'll best start off with the bare basics um an electromagnetic field is is actually two fields one's an electric field and one's a magnetic field and they are inexorably mixed together um and they're measured with a meter that is um specifically designed for the job um it, it, there are different types, there are different ways it can be done, but uh, they're all lumped under the, the heading of EMF meter, electromagnetic field meter. Mm-hmm. And they've been very popular with ghost investigators for around about the last 10 or 15 years. Um, some call them ghost detectors. Some believe that they're ghost communication devices. Mm-hmm. Some people, you know, they, they try and get the spirits to flash the lights or that they can measure the energy that's either emitted or manipulated, the electromagnetic energy that's either uh, uh, emitted or manipulated, depending on which theory or idea they subscribe to. Uh, however, there is a problem. 
because the vast majority of EMF meters, unless you're going to spend $1,500, um, will only tell you how much there is. So not where it's coming view... from, not what it is and where it's coming from. Exactly. Mm. So, so an electromagnetic field, like all energy, is made up of two components. There's the amplitude, the, ima the total amount, and there's the frequency, which is its specific fingerprint. Uh, most of the meters that are available for under, you know, three, four hundred dollars. So the, the standard ghost hunting K2, the cell sensor, the 1394, the Mel, the ghost arc, etc., etc., will only tell you how much. It's, it's kind of like um, walking down the road and somebody throwing a bucket of something over you. Uh, it might be pee, it might be water. <laughs> you have no idea what it is that he's been thrown over you other than you are measuring in degrees of how wet you are. Mm. So you don't have any information about the nature or the source of the electromagnetic field. If you have the frequency information, which much more expensive meters can provide, you can then refer to because the electromagnetic frequency is very well regulated in the United States and throughout the rest of the world. And it's also very well understood by physicists and by scientists. And you can readily take the frequency uh, to the internet and you can look up what the, the likely okay. natural cause is. Now, that could be a natural cause. It can be a man-made cause. It could be a radio transmission. But without that information, That's you're the key just... To it. You're just wetter, yeah. and you don't know why. Steve, we actually have a caller on the line. All right. Uh, hopefully this... No, we don't. That sounds like we're calling somebody. Please hang up and try it. Oh. Oh, no, <laughs> it's one of Cal Cooper's telephone oh, calls dear. from the dead. <laughs> Perhaps you've got them on hold. Yeah, I, do. Uh, I don't know. Okay. I guess uh, you got them off. Caller... Uh, the... Try again. Let's, let's, let's put it that way. So, Steve, if it would be best to maybe uh, spend a little bit more money on a you know a higher quality EMF reader, and then that measures the that registers the frequency, so that you can determine what is causing that frequency. Uh, well, unfortunately, it's not just a little more money. You are going to have to pay substantially more money. To, How to substantially? Uh, they started around about $1,000 oh, to $1,500. Really? But you think of the amount of money that your average team invests in their collection of EMF meters. And if they, if they switched all that around and traded it, that, that, um, you know, that amount of capital for one um, of the... Uh, frequency and amplitude meters, they would get a great deal more information, mm. great deal more bang for their buck. And in, most importantly, and this is what I hope would come across in ghostology, is that within science, if we look at astronomy or archaeology and lots of other sciences, lots of major discoveries have been highlighted and, and first um, discovered by amateur researchers mm. but amateur researchers who were following protocols and were able to present to uh, their academic their, their science counterparts substantial evidence, evidence that yeah. there was something to study unfortunately running around in the dark with a a, a, a digital recorder and a meter that's only telling you how many lights you got or <laughs> yeah. you okay. can't produce info, evidence, anything that will that will interest the scientists or interest mm. the parapsychologists and they'll just look at it and go well there's nothing here you're not showing me anything yeah i see your so, point sometimes money isn't everything steve we do have the caller back on the line again so, hello hi can you hear me yes Loudly. we can hear you <laughs> yes yes we can you have a have a uh, question for steve Yes, I do. Uh, hi, Steve. This is Jim. Uh, you know me. We had coffee down at Seabrook Beach there one day. <laughs> okay, cool. Hi, Jim. Um, I got a question for you that is rocket science, uh -oh. in a way. Um, with the recent story in the news about uh, the magnetic telescope, which confirmed Einstein's theory from 100 years ago, mm -hmm. that there, there are ripples in the fabric of time and space, how does this uh, affect uh, 
our views on the paranormal and the, the very nature of it. Could, well, it's it's could what we it's, see as ghosts actually be time slips. Well, time slip phenomena are something that I find fascinating. It's something that we have many, many reports from from, from a very small area of the city of Liverpool, uh, where I used to live. Um, the discovery of, of gravity waves that was that was uh, um, f uh, found very recently in North using um, the inter interferometers in North America. And I've got to say, you know, living over here in the UK, all of the data was crunched in Cardiff, in West, in Wales, wow. um, for the for the research, and it, it's it's fascinating from one particular stance because up until very recently, if you'd had, if you'd asked a physicist to define gravity, they actually couldn't. They knew exactly what it did uh, in a very predictable way. That's why we put man on the moon, and that's why we can predict the paths of asteroids and you know, remember to duck on March the 5th <laughs> um, with, what is it, 2013 T TX-68? Um, but they haven't been able to, to measure it and to understand it. In terms of the second part of your question, how it relates to the paranormal, um, I don't think it, it necessarily affects people. Um, it doesn't affect what I do in terms of people's reporting of apparitional encounters. Um, however, there are some interesting implications when we consider gravity, perhaps in terms of poltergeist phenomena where objects are moving, where objects appear to pass other things, uh, because there is clearly the potential for a distortion in space time and gravity allows us to understand better space time. Uh, so it might offer some opportunities to develop new theories and new hypotheses that can be tested. Does that answer your question, Jim? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, pretty much. I, I guess. I guess what I'm getting at is that if you witness an apparition, uh, I'm just wondering if Steve thinks it's possible that you're not seeing a dead person, but you're seeing a live person who in their time has suddenly become has become connected to our time oh no sorry Jay. i yes um abs and certainly with the time slips that's that must be um a distinct consideration because one of the one of the the basic premises of einstein's theory relating to space time is that time is is not linear in that it wraps around itself and it can twist around itself. And it's, I remember try, uh, having a, a very interesting discussion um, many, many years ago, talking, to, talking to, to a physicist, and we were saying that the only difference, uh, the spot we were standing was right next to a dinosaur's footprint in, in, in a rock. And the only difference between us and that dinosaur was time. Hmm. Spatially, we were in exactly the same same spot. Yeah. So it was only time itself that was separating us. And our understanding of time, we perceive it as a linear experience. It, it starts at, at zero and it progresses around the clock. But let's look at time in, in, from 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 you know purely an experiential point of view. Where you are, it's nine forty six in the evening. Where I am, it's two forty six in the morning, the day ahead of you. In other parts of the world, it's yesterday. In other parts of the world, it's tomorrow. We have this very human view of time and how we interpret time. And when we try to relate our experiences to time, um, then, then we, start to, you know, we start to mess with our own heads first and foremost. Yeah. And physics now tells us that you know time itself is is not how we experience it; that it's non-linear, uh, that it does fold and twist and wrap around on itself. And Einstein, you know, he's they're proving him right all of the time, um, and he did say that time travel is 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 possible as well. So maybe some of these experiences, and there are certainly many that we I have documented um, up in on Merseyside and throughout the United Kingdom where people have interacted with their environment and other people but 
they are clearly in a different time, um, separated by uh, minutes, hours, decades, and yet in, they're in the same location. You know, we've had a gentleman who has, uh, you know, they've, they've seen the street that they are in and interacted with people as it was 70 years ago. We've had uh, other people in this exactly the same spot report seeing themselves. Yeah, it's strange. What yeah. they were doing just a few moments before. Yeah, alternate reality. That would be so, kind of freaky, yeah. So yeah, what, what you have there is uh, spatially, they're exactly the same location. They're only separated by something that's non-linear. <laughs> You know, so, another element to that, Steve, is you could see somebody that was maybe, you know, 10 years ago, but you could also possibly perceive their ghost. Uh, so you could perceive both of them because of time being turning and twisting. Uh, if you can see them in there. Go ahead. There are instances um, where there are um, ghosts of. In fact, the, one of the most common reported ghosts is actually the ghost of the living person, uh, the, the bilocating mm. doppelganger, call mm -hmm. it what you will, um, which are far more common, or they used to be far more common until the television got hold of it. <laughs> um, and now it's demons, of course. We don't really fully understand time. We, no. we, we experience it, and we understand our experience of time in that, you know, it's a linear sequence from birth to death to the next generation to tomorrow, the day after, next week, yesterday and beyond. But time itself is not acting like that. Uh, and it has to be a distinct consideration and something that, that it would be folly to simply dismiss the possibility that you could meet yourself coming back from going where you were yesterday or even, you know, meet meet your dead self. Yes, exactly. That was the or point your I was making. Self. Yeah. Uh, you know, is it, it really ghost, does uh, curl you know, back are, on itself? I don't think it, it certainly doesn't explain all of the cases um, because I think with ghosts, you you have a, a generic word. Uh, it's a bit like the word automobile. <laughs> we you know, there are lots of different makes and model. A time slip possibility could explain some limited cases mm. the same as um as described in in in, in my first book paracoustics low frequency infrasound can explain some instances of paranormal experiences but not all not all of them. and yeah. i think what you've got is a jumbled up mixture of different experiences uh, being being given the same sort of broad brush label. If if you see a misty, shapeless grey figure uh, out of the corner of your eye, you might describe uh, to other people that you saw a ghost. If you see a solid apparition in a Puritan outfit striding towards you that then suddenly disappears or walks through a wall, you would say to people, I saw a ghost. The two mechanisms might be completely and utterly different. Yeah. And, yeah. for example, before we came on air tonight, I was watching a... Uh, well, I could see in, in vivid colour uh, Michael Jackson singing and dancing in the corner of my room. Now, clearly, I wasn't seeing a ghost, but I was seeing a recording, so maybe there is some way that you know the past can be the present or even the future that's right we just don't have words it's a matter of semantics we don't, we don't completely this understand is where, this is where people who claim that they have proof um, fall because you can't prove something that we don't understand you can't prove that's the right. existence of ghosts or an afterlife because we don't yet know what ghosts are. Um, you know, there's a guy, I think he was in Boston fairly recently, who, who claimed to have discovered or it created a ghost trap. So, I guess somewhat similar to the Ghostbusters. You know, he claimed to have trapped a poltergeist and kept it in this glass box for the last 10 years and hmm. blah, blah, blah. In order to do that, he must have understood exactly what one is. 
Well, you know what, Steve? There is a movie, The Entity, and yeah, <laughs> they're supposed to have done that in that movie. Actually, it's based on a true life experience. So, well, the early part of it is. It was uh, uh, freeze dried. It was like the ghost was freeze dried, right? Freeze-dried. Yeah. Well, yeah. the early the the the. <laughs> Based on a true story, I think it's a Hollywood euphemism for for mostly made up, um, using the characters' names. Yes, the entity case was based upon a, a, a true story, mm-hmm. um, as as a lot of them are. But then the screenwriters get hold of it <laughs> uh, and, yeah. and run over the hills and far away. Um, you know, we've got a great example of that coming out this year in The Conjuring Two. Uh, which is the Enfield case, Ed and Lorraine Warren, you know, come to the UK and sort out the the most terrifying poltergeist uh, uh, encounter. However, they arrived, they spent, I think, they arrived at the end of the case. They popped in unannounced one evening and spent two hours there. I think is the reality of it. Really? Yeah. It made quite a story, though, didn't it? <laughs> uh, they, well, it made quite a Hollywood story. I don't, you know, but then people... It's kind of like with the paranormal in many ways. Um, people don't really ask the sort of questions that Jim asked. Um, people don't consider in any depth the the questions that need to be asked and the implications of what their of what their experience is. Mm. They get a voice on a recorder, and there is an immediate assumption. You see it on on investigations when you watch them on YouTube. You know the 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 lead investigator of the team will will produce a, a digital recorder he'll say is there anybody there play back the <laughs> 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 oh my god it said yes <laughs> well, yeah i know i know <laughs> well, did and it it's say a glass anything? A EVP. Yeah, yeah and then of course everybody else in the room because they don't want to feel left out will all you know, oh yeah it did didn't it oh that was amazing that was proof of the paranormal it was proof of absolutely nothing apart from a very <laughs> dodgy bit of pseudoscience and you know, it was Barnum-like hucksterism. Yeah. Um, well, uh, anyway, uh, Jim, I don't know if you're still there, but uh, yeah, I am. Oh, okay. I'm going to uh, I'm going to hang up and go oh. back to the program. Thanks. All for, right, uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, thank th- you, Jim. Thank you for the call, Jim. And uh, Steve, I hope the wind goes down for you. I <laughs> shall see you in the fall. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so Steve, we're getting really short on time. One of the questions I really wanted to ask you was, what do you consider? really good evidence measurable evidence or evidence of the presence of something paranormal like was it an evp and where did you get it uh the the holy grail for any investigator is is where the objective evidence that's evidence coming from a machine Mm -hmm. um or a recorder matches or corroborates the subjective information evidence that's provided by the human so uh whenever anybody has an experience and they discuss it that's a subjective experience and what you're looking for is a correlation i feel the temperature is dropping and you can measure that right and that that does happen on very rare occasions and it has happened but how about uh, you for a personal experience can you cite an example i can i was stood oh, good in, in a shipyard um in the middle of the night um you know, i was better let's take it to somebody's house we were in the middle of a, somebody's house one night uh we'd had uh, they'd obviously had experiences that involved temperature we'd had a number of temperature recorders around the room i was outside some of the other team were inside and i came in because it was my turn to swap around and as i walked into the room it was distinctly colder than the outside you know it's not often you walk from outside to in um you know in britain we don't have air conditioning um mm-hmm. <laughs> not routinely anyway mm-hmm. um and this was an old sort of 18th 17th uh, 18th century property and i i commented immediately my god it's cold in, in here at that precise moment and unknown to me um our remote automatic temperature recording equipment had just recorded an 11 degree temperature drop over 40 seconds oh my. Wow. now at that moment when it peaked at the bottom when it sort of bottomed out the temperature inside the building was four degrees lower in celsius um, than the temperature outside the building mm. now we we did some tests later and we realized that we would if we took every door and window off the building and just opened it up to the outside world because of even the residual heat uh, it would have been warmer the, the, it would have stayed warmer for 
up about 14 or 15 hours before the temperature equalized between indoors and outside. Mm. So 11 degrees in, you know, in that very short space of time is something that shouldn't happen. The, the second law of thermodynamics says it can't happen, yet it did happen. And there were two investigators, myself and another one who walked in just behind me, who both immediately exclaimed as to the cold. Um, mm. there, have been, there have been lots of other examples, and I would think that the most important thing for investigators to measure is temperature. It's way more important a than... A really than good indicator. E e EMF, because yeah. right the way back for 100 years of psychical research, we have well-measured, documented accounts of the temperature doing really odd stuff whilst people are reporting having a paranormal experience. Mm. And yeah. temperature just is not fashionable anymore. <laughs> well, Steve, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I'm darn. so sorry, Steve. <laughs> Gosh darn it. <laughs> you, you can go to bed now. <laughs> cool. <laughs> we didn't cover all the material uh, we wanted to, but there's so much more to talk about. It's all in, it's, it's all in ghostology, and you can get it from Amazon.com. And anything uh, and else you'd like to mention? Parascience? That's a wonderful song. No, no, just buy the book. Buy the book. Oh, buy the book. <laughs> buy, buy them both. Buy both books, right? Buy There's both books and visit parascience.org. <laughs> .org.uk. Dot, uh, dot .org.uk? If, dot if, if you don't have the .uk, you get a sort of kind of crazy American group. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. We don't want that. <laughs> Who wants us? Uh, Steve, thank you uh, so much for joining us tonight. Yeah, it was been a an pleasure. Absolute pleasure, guys. Th thank you, Steve. Thank, thank you for you staying. And up. a lot warmer than stood outside DD on a wet, on a cold, <laughs> wet morning. <laughs> thank you, Steve. Right. Good morning and good night. Yeah, good so, morning and good night. Good, good, good luck. Good night. Yeah, thank you, Steve. See you in the fall, guys. All right. Great. Okay, bye bye. Excellent. Bye bye. Right. All right, and uh, that is. Spirit Radio, the paranormal experience, and Craig Mosier with the Graveyard Shift is coming right up. And once again, thank you everyone for listening, and you have a good evening. Mm -hmm.